All right, it is time to get into the GP observations. Um, it was well, quite an quite an interesting Grand Prix, albeit the the result was somewhat concluded after lap one, turn one. But uh, it was it was very interesting how we got to the result, regardless. So uh, let's just jump from the top. First observation: it was a perfect weekend from Verstappen. Quite. Yeah. You know, he drove a perfect weekend. He broke an interesting t statistic that was building up this season of the uh, of the driver who leads FP1 and 2 um, never, never winning the Grand Prix. Well, he's broken that statistic. There are some caveats around it, I suppose. Uh, like Leclerc not actually being a, a, being a feature this weekend due to well due to decisions made by Ferrari and due to uh, just reliability issues in general technical issues in general but yes this was otherwise a perfect weekend from Verstappen what more is there to say I'm only noting it on account of <laughs> it was a perfect weekend um, we haven't seen anyone uh, pull out a perfect weekend so far you know the clear looked on for it in Spain and then it all came undone and, and well he's been he's been going backwards since really so but perfect weekend from Friday to Sunday even with the rain affected um, Saturday you know he was still top of the timesheets in FP3 and then of course Saturday he got the pole and, and he looks well on his way to securing a quote-unquote second championship he looks well on his way i would be very surprised if he was unseated at this point albeit there are some there are some ways he can be unseated particularly if the regulations fall contra well the adjustment in regulations that will be coming fall contra to how i believe they will fall all right just for posterity i, I don't know if i mentioned it in the previous video I don't believe I did the plank measurement adjustments are coming in for future weekends they weren't actually in play for this Canadian Grand Prix this Canadian Grand Prix was more of a data gathering data gathering exercise by the FIA in order to give them some sort of um, some sort of measurements to work with some sort of knowledge and a range to work with and that could go on for more than just this Canadian Grand Prix weekend, mind you. That could still be in play for Silverstone. But all of this is just in context without those new regulations in play. So, Verstappen's driven a perfect weekend. Uh, Perez, he'll get a solo video. It's very, it's very interesting that, um, well, the, the timing of his, of his retirement is very... It's very useful for for Verstappen. Uh, likewise, um, Perez fumbling the ball anyway in in qualifying. Although it, it looked like it looked like the throttle got stuck or something, but I, I digress. I digress. Not it's not even worth getting into. At the end of the day, it's academic. So, in all in all conditions, Verstappen did it. It was quite quite interesting. And. Um, the Saturday conditions got pretty wild at times, but I liked that. I appreciated that the stewards actually just let the cars talk to do their function. And yeah, it might look a little harem scarem for for you know ten minutes or <laughs> or a few laps, but it'll clear up quicker than you think. You'll see teams start start taking some chances here and there. So. That was refreshing to see, albeit I do still wonder why Monaco was red flags for so long. Anyway, let's not get into that. Alright, number two, James Allison. He's made he's made an appearance, a cameo, on race weekend. So, um, why is James Allison there? Well, to get the real eyes on the car, you know, the number one eyes on the car. And um, to discuss what exactly the FIA and Braun and friends are going to do and all the teams 
um, what exactly they're going to do about the porpoising. I can't say what exactly they'll do one way or the other. <laughs> I really can't. Um, they will probably find something that's pretty low cost in order to correct the whole thing. It might even be like a, a mandatory um, gap in the floor for all we know. It might just be something as mundane as that. So it's not even, it's not really worth putting a lot of uh, brain power towards because they, well, they've, they've already got all the brain power in the room and they're gonna pick something anyway. Yeah, it was just worthwhile to note that ooh, James Allison is now is now here for the weekend. All right, did Tracing Martin fumble the ball, or did they sandbag it up again? You know, was there a bit too much interest in the car, but too much heat on the car, and did they sandbag it up again? Because well, everyone was expecting them to perform well. I mean, even they themselves were expecting to perform well. It looks like they've really just fumbled the ball here. Uh, what, what, what was the key detail? They decided to get a new set of wet tires in Q1, and they just they just couldn't switch them on. They couldn't switch them on, and um, it was it was it was actually more beneficial to just <laughs> it was more beneficial to have just stayed out on the circuit and not even pit for tires, not even stop the car. Unless just to put some fuel in, I suppose. But yeah, it looks like they fumbled the ball. Uh, I don't believe they are sandbagging anymore. This this is not really the Grand Prix to sandbag at. Um, Stroll has driven a decent enough recovery race to finish 10th. He's driven decently enough. So uh, it's not really the end of the world for Tracing Martin. Uh, I still have some big question marks about their philosophy in general, but it's not really the end of the world for for them. Whatever happened in qualifying, that's not really the end of the world. Uh, the the main the main litmus test for me still is whatever happens in Silverstone with that team and that car, and then my review might either be well, <laughs> it might be a little less scathing depending on what happens. I mean, it's going to be scathing regardless, like, I should probably just accept that. But it will probably be a little less scathing, depending what specifically happens at Silverstone. And I am expecting a lot of teams to be bringing upgrades to Silverstone. Will that actually be the case? Well, we can just wait and see, that's all we can really do. Alright, this is a good point in the season to perhaps talk about cars that qualify well and race poorly and the vice versa of that cars that qualify poorly and race well so the cars that look like they qualify well and race poorly so far this season i'm not saying my word is the gospel or anything <laughs> you know, i'm not saying my word is the quote-unquote gospel on this but the cars that look like they qualify well are the ferrari haas and Alpine. Uh, now that might just be the Ferrari qualifying well in the hands of Leclerc. Yes, the Ferrari does strike me as a car that uh, does not race well relative to its competition. It does however qualify very well. So you would imagine if at circuits where, mind you, overtaking isn't, um, well it is still difficult but I, it's actually easier than it was last season if you were to ask me. I'm not sure what the drivers would say, but if you were to ask me, it's easier than last season to overtake. And last season, well, last season was a good balance as well, but anyway. At any circuit where it will be perhaps a little more difficult to overtake, it will be worthwhile to see if Ferrari can actually out-qualify Red Bull over there. And this happened at Monaco, but well, everything went wrong for, well, everything that could have gone wrong with him still netting a finish, <laughs> I suppose. But everything went wrong for Charles, um, despite everything having fallen just right for a a Monaco Grand Prix victory. And he's still, uh, quite frankly, reeling from that even now. It doesn't help that there's a another retirement 
in Baku, it's a double whammy now, or it's actually like a triple whammy, whatever, no, no, just a double whammy, just a double whammy, but this is something that I want people to consider going forward, is that there are cars that qualify well and race poorly, and that there are cars that qualify poorly and race well. For the cars that qualify poorly and race well, uh, you're looking at, I guess, Red Bull, uh, the Alfa Romeo, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't really say it's not, it's not really, it's not particularly consistent at the moment. But the Alfa Romeo, uh, the Mercedes, arguably, you might also argue that they're just in the middle ground, like McLaren, depends on uh, the setup that they find for the weekend. And Tracy Martin, so far, well, with their traced up car, qualified poorly and race well, albeit still have to get a few more Grand Prix worth, worth of data on Tracing Martin. Yeah, any teams that I haven't that I haven't mentioned are, are really just um, middle ground teams. It just it looks like it just depends what the what the drivers find on the on the day, what the teams find on the day or on the weekend. It looks it looks like it just depends solely on that. It doesn't look like they're particularly gated by anything else. But a Mick Schumacher, he's qualified very well. You know, it, it, it looks like things are about to come just right for him, and you know, suddenly, boom, the car goes out. He can't catch a break. He can't catch a break when it looks like it's going well. <laughs> it's not gonna go well. I don't expect that to last all season. I'd be very surprised if it lasted all season for Baby Schumacher. Both his bad luck when he does find good form, and then his bad luck in general away from that good form anyway the lad he just cannot catch a break right now at least it looks that way to me and he's performed uh, very very well in a difficult qualifying session but uh, you know that can't really be <laughs> that can't really be um the hill to die on for baby Schumacher oh, remember that qualifying session in Canada 2022 like come on now. that can't be the hill to die on that absolutely cannot be the hill to die on he's got to pull out some sort of some sort of drive somewhere get to the finish have the car not let him down and that has to, that has to happen a few times <laughs> maybe like at least three times until we get to spa but will that actually happen I don't know these weekends don't seem to come by often for baby Schumacher and it, it turns out to be a case a lot of the time with him of oh well what if what if he finished in Miami or what if XYZ and it's 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 not a it's not a healthy place to be in and he's got to find a point a points finish at some point I mean Joe Joe didn't have a, a duck to break he already got points on his debut but now he's gotten points again, so, <laughs> so it's a it's a bit of a problem for Baby Schumacher. And um, I suppose it's worthwhile to talk about Alonso because he's qualified really well. Uh, I wouldn't say he's raced poorly, but the Alpine does generally fall back. They did not necessarily fall back. Um, in Monaco, I suppose, but they generally qualify well and fall back. That seems to be something that something that they just do with their car. But Alonso, he fell a little further back than <laughs> than was perhaps strategized. And you know, people might argue about who the most on-form driver is this way or that way. For me, for me, on current form, it is Alonso. He is the most on-form driver, but he's also got the most on-form banana peel and that banana peel is always there just to slip him up everywhere he goes and now he's 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 been outshone one could argue by his his teammate Esteban Ocon and his countryman Carlos Sainz when on Saturday he was he was the hero he looked like he was gonna <laughs> in the war of the countrymen between between Sainz and Alonso, it looked like he was going to, he he was going to come out on top. We were going to have people asking after the Grand Prix, oh, well, why don't 
Ferrari just signed Alonso again. Like, look, look at him. He's beating signs. So, you know, it was, it was edging that way <laughs> for a moment there. And look at that. It's all come undone on race day. A long way undone. Yes, the race was a bit, a bit borkish, a bit stop and start. Yes, it was a bit of a difficult race in that context, but he's fallen back a long way, Alonso. He's fallen back a long, long way, Alonso. And, well, where do you go from here? What are Alpine going to do? Are they actually going to um, take a chance on... Piastri, supposedly he's going to Williams for how long? Is anyone's guess? Alonso, he is in very good form though. I, I, I always think it's worth mentioning that Alonso is just in very good form. The Verstappen was perhaps not in, not in the form that he was in this weekend, and Leclerc not in the form that he was in, in prior weekends. Well, we would be perhaps talking very differently about Alonso. But this is just the way it falls now. Why it is this way, I can tell you one way or the other. Charles Leclerc. I gotta talk about Charles Leclerc. Charles, <laughs> he, has, he has failed to execute the damage limitation strategy this weekend. He's failed to do that. I don't know if people are gonna I'm gonna mention that or not. I've tried to stay away from some from some GP reactions, quite frankly. But he has indeed failed to execute the damage limitation strategy. He needed to get a podium and at worst finish fourth. This Grand Prix. That's what he needed to do. That would have already been bad enough, but that's what he needed to do. And he didn't do that. Ideally with the way actually with the way things actually panned out. <laughs> <laughs> Until he could have finished second. That wasn't even on the, on the, on the cards either. So, uh, where, where to for the club from here? Thankfully, for him, thankfully, the season is quite long. He can still find, his, find himself on the champion's path again later on, later on in the season. He very well could do that. Uh, w would I put money on it? No. I don't bet or gamble in general. It's very uh, questionable practice, but but would I put money on it? No, I definitely wouldn't. Put, you could put more money on on Paris right now. He's actually not supposed to be able to do that. But you could put money on Paris for now, and it would probably be better money than putting it on Leclerc. Leclerc, he could run interference right now. That's what he could do. If he is to win the championship from here, then he has to be on, well, on the form that he's been in when the car is let him down. And um, he has to hope Perez and Sainz find themselves in, in better form than Verstappen. He's got to hope for Monaco again and again, but he can't really do that. He can't really do that just yet. In my belief, had he won at Monaco, well, had he won at Monaco, <laughs> he would have, he would have, uh, he would have figured out a new gear to this game. He would have, he would have learned something quite valuable by doing so. But he hasn't done so. He's finished, thankfully for, um, for his psyche. He's finished, but it wasn't a notable result. It wasn't a worthwhile result. Even the podium would have been, would have been more worthwhile <laughs> than what he got. And likewise, the retirements in Spain and Baku. Uh, they've just compounded now. And, um, yeah, the only saving grace from really is that the season is long. And that the likes of Perez and Sainz could still possibly run interference. Do I find it feasible for Sainz or Perez to actually run interference when both Verstappen and Leclerc are on form, no. I don't find that feasible. But hey, it could happen. It could happen. Paris won at Monaco, anything could happen. But at this juncture with the form Verstappen is in, um, I mean, you would, you would even need Mercedes to run interference. Now that might happen. To whose benefit at the, at the point of the season that it happens, 
as anyone's gears. But Mercedes are, are probably going to run interference very soon. Ideally, it would be for Leclerc if you don't want to Verstappen to win. If you want Verstappen to win, it looks like he's going to have Mercedes run interference in his favor. We'll see how petty and spiteful Mercedes can actually be sometime soon. We'll see. I expect them to be very sporting, but we'll, we'll see just how, <laughs> just how petty things can get. But Charles, he's been, um, he's, he's been itching to put the perfect weekend together. He's been itching to do it and he just can't, he just can't break the voodoo. And Verstappen, he broke the voodoo. Leclerc, he can't quite do it yet. So it'll be interesting to see just how Leclerc responds in the next Grand Prix with some new, uh, with some new power unit parts to play with. Unless, who knows, they, they, they take some more parts in, in Silverstone. Who knows? Ferrari could do anything. They are just quote unquote learning how to compete again by their own words. So I shouldn't really be expecting a, a title challenging swag as it were. I look like he could still challenge from this point. That's the footnote at the end of the day. He could still challenge from this point. All he would need is for signs to be able to play some interference when Verstappen is off form and likewise for Perez to play some interference and ideally for Mercedes to play some interference briefly in his favor. Will that happen? Anyone's guess. Will Ferrari fumble the ball when it is happening? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably. Let's be real about it. But hey, Hey, this is F1, we, we, we take the ups with the downs. Alright, next observation. A science fails to find an edge on Verstappen. And, um, well, would Leclerc have failed in the same position? Uh, probably. Yeah, probably would have failed as well. Verstappen, he is, um, he is very complete as a driver after going against Sir Lewis Hamilton last season. He's just very complete. Would Leclerc have been able to overtake him? Unlikely. Would Sergio Perez have been able to overtake him? It's unlikely. What is the weakest area of, um, of Verstappen's driving right now? I, I, some people would argue a wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat. Some people would argue um, defensive driving, what have you. Some people might even argue it's qualifying, who knows? But e even just on accounts of that, it would be up for grabs like that. It's telling that, yeah, he is a complete driver at this point. Does that mean he's uh, 10 out of 10 in all areas? No. His weakest area for me is defensive driving. Now, that's only on accounts of the, the FIA nerfing his moving in the braking zone thing that he was doing. For me, at least. It's only on accounts of that. And I don't believe they should have removed that, but that will probably be a spicy take anyway. I understand why they removed it. Um, <laughs> it's probably half the grid can't uh, can't actually drive that way. So yeah, that, that, what he was doing there was um, yeah that that came from the classroom of the elite. That that. <laughs> that stuff that came from the classroom of the elite that moving in the braking zone stuff uh, it's, he's very fortunate that you know the most notable time he busted it out he was against the likes of uh, Kimi Raikkonen and Sebastian Vettel he is very he's very lucky because uh, there's a few men who wouldn't he wouldn't be able to do that <laughs> You absolutely would not be able to drive around a guy who could do that or even just react to it, it would just be a collision. And Ricardo is probably not, not one of them. That doesn't even have to be in there. But Sainz, yeah, he's failed to find an edge on Verstappen, like many others. And it's not surprising to me. I mean, if. if you know, I hope people were not really hoping that 
science was going so well I, I can understand hoping but you know to actually think that he would be able to pull off the overtake on Verstappen it's just it's just so unlikely considering I've seen them uh, both be rookies at Toro Rosso uh, perhaps I'm seeing it different but even even from then it was obvious that okay this Verstappen guy is He's definitely the star boy of these two. I mean, it would have to be a car gap if science is going to overtake Verstappen. It would have to be a car gap, and maybe even a sizable one at that. I don't see how he's going to outrace him, as it were, or even outthink him on the circuit. I just don't see how he's going to do that. He's not going to do what George Russell did, for instance, on, on the defense, especially. He's not going to do that. So, where does science go from here? I. I'm not really sure. Um, perhaps he licks his wounds till till next season. Does the good soldier thing, and perhaps he builds up a head of steam going into the Spanish Grand Prix this time, rather than the unfortunate set of events that that befall him en route to Spain. Rather than rather than all that, because that's that's lopsided his season. That's lopsided his form. I mean, on a different season, you know, I could see signs perhaps challenging Verstappen more convincingly. At least for me. Maybe for someone else, he challenged convincingly. Didn't really look challenged. Didn't really look convincing to me. But that aside, the Ferrari challenge in general this weekend wasn't all that convinc convincing, even with Leclerc taking his penalties. I mean. One, science should never be, should never ever be dropping second place in qualifying when there's a an, an over half a second gap to fall into. Should never ever be dropping that. You should never ever. What was what was the final gap from Verstappen to to second place after after qualifying? What was it? Seven tenths or something? Should never ever be failing to beat another car in that in that rate of time you should never ever not when you are arguably best car on the grid first whether it's best car or second best car that will only be decided by the constructors championship looks like red bull are going to win the constructors championship by the way but regardless you're gonna have the second best car minimum by the end of the season you can't be losing up on second place on, on the grid <laughs> when there's such a big gap of time to fall into it was just poor from science either way to be out qualified by Alonso in an Alpine yes Alonso is most on form driver for me but it's just it's just it's just not a good look it's just not a good look for science you're in a Ferrari fortunately the race has fallen your way in the best potential outcome for anyone reasonable. Uh, I didn't see him winning the race on this, unless maybe Verstappen had uh, an engine issue like Perez did. Oof, I wonder if Red Bull were clutching their pearls for a second there. But unless that happened, I, I, I don't see any other way that science would have perhaps found. A or maybe, I, I don't know why this was being talked about going into the Grand Prix. But if Alonso collided with um, Verstappen going into turn one, I don't know why that was being talked up heading into this round. That was very silly. Whether Alonso said said something akin to it, that was very silly. But I I digress. Yes, it's not been a good weekend for for Ferrari. Even though they've seen two cars to the finish line, it's not been a good weekend. <laughs> and that. Uh, that's a bit of a, a bit of an oxymoron, but it, it is what it is. It's just not been a good weekend for them. I mean, Spain was a far better weekend. Monaco was a better weekend. There was just some some human error that cost them one way or the other. But here, Leclerc, he's not managed to execute on what he could have executed, and signs. I mean, these. I don't want to say. Oops. I don't want to say he's proven me right or wrong one way or the other. It's just that 
this is what it is for science. All right, next observation. Zhao Guanyu has had a standout weekend. Standout. His luck had to had to fall for him at some point, didn't it? I'm I'm just quite delighted for him. I don't even know if it's if it's really worth having just a a standalone point for Zhao Guanyu, quite frankly. But he's had a standout weekend, especially with the difficulties presented on Saturday with the weather. Uh, you wouldn't expect that from from a rookie, you just wouldn't expect, expect it at all. And at this point he is perhaps unfortunate that he's the only rookie on the grid. He's perhaps a little unfortunate on that front because there's no one else to really compare him to. If someone else who was perhaps a rookie would have, would have maybe struggled with the conditions uh, during Saturday. He doesn't have that to sort of to sort of compare with but at the same time uh, you know he hasn't had someone to compare with to build up pressure all this time he hasn't been able to find a result so it falls both ways but Joe he's found him has found his way to the finish on a weekend with the car is pretty decent and boom he's found points and the, the, you know a rookie coming in scoring on his debut well I don't know how valuable scoring on debut is to some people who are watching F1 right now. I mean, back in the day, it was really difficult to score on your debut because points only went down to sixth, and then at some point they went down to eighth, they upped that. Now we have points down to tenth. But to score on debut, regardless, you know, regardless of whatever the point system, well, unless it's points awarded for every every finisher that would be that would be a wacky a wacky era to live in but um, to score points on debut is always really difficult as a rookie always really difficult like it's not really to be scoffed at so he's been quite unfortunate for me to be having so many reliability issues especially with Bottas on the opposite end like you know battling with the Mercedes and what have you and I, I do I don't expect that to be gone fully for the season I don't expect that to be gone I expect it to uh, fade away for a few Grand Prix and then somewhat come back into the fall and then really come back into the fall for the end of the season after fading away but like momentarily but e either way Bottas, for a while, he's been having really strong weekends for whatever reason, whether it's because the engineers are all jumping to work on Bottas's car, all the best engineers, or what have you. But wow, the chips finally fell just right for Zhou Guan Yu, uh, first on his debut. And now here in Canada, a bit of a spicy, flavorful weekend. I should call it that. This wasn't a spicy weekend, but this was a flavorful weekend, you know. A little bit of a flavorful weekend was thrown up. Now, will Zhou maintain this this type of form? I don't expect him to. I will be very surprised if he does. I would expect him to do this again in, I don't know, four Grand Prix or five Grand Prix time, assuming that he's he's finishing any of these Grand Prix. If the car finishes again next Grand Prix and the Grand Prix after that and he's getting points in both, I don't know, it's, it might perhaps put some 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 pressure on someone like Mick Schumacher. I don't really think there's a wrong move Zhou can make from here unless he just like crashes the car repeatedly. That would be something. But I don't see that happening. I really, I really don't see that happening. And he's got Bottas as a, as a mentor, quote unquote. If Bottas would perform that role for him, so Joe's in a very, a very good place. Uh, he perhaps doesn't have as many years on his side. I suppose people would be a lot more intrigued and awed if he was uh, perhaps still a teenager, eighteen or nineteen, or even just twenty maybe at most 21 but I digress he's had a very good he's had a very good weekend here yeah. a very good weekend you wouldn't expect a rookie to do this 
I've said that already, gotta say it again. You would never expect a rookie to pull out this type of weekend, considering the type of weekend it was. And this is very impressive from Michelle. Very impressive. Anyway, let's see if he maintains it. Time for some sundry observations. All right, so first uh, McLaren Battle of the Fates update. Uh, Ricardo, he's finished ahead of Norris. You know, all power to him. But um, there's there's no there's no meat on the bone. There's no points attached to it, so does does it matter? Does it really matter? That's just my question. To me, it doesn't it doesn't really matter that he's finished ahead of Norris yet. Just on account of there's no points to it, because when Norris has finished ahead. <laughs> It's been a different type of result for him. It is good news for Ricardo that he is still um, still in good form coming off of Baku. And it's also very good news to him for him that um, Norris has started to encounter some voodoo, some gremlins in the system. Perhaps on account of his behavior in Baku, who knows. Uh, next sundry points, uh, Ocon's brakes are on fire in practice <laughs> I, I believe it was due to kitchen paper Canadians are very loose with the litter you wouldn't expect that considering you know the whole save the world mantra that that, that comes out of um, liberal thinkers from the area but you know there's brakes well I say brakes it was just what was it the right front brake caught fire because some kitchen paper blocked uh, the cooling vent. The cool the cooling vents. Now I, I, I did say that I expected to see a brake explode somewhere over the weekend. Uh, I think just on account of the way the weather fell, uh, teams didn't exactly push limits on brake cooling uh, because they just didn't have the knowledge. You can't really trust the Friday knowledge I mean I mean you're not really driving the car in anger well in absolute anger at least so you can't really trust the uh, the Friday data so it seems to my understanding at least they would have just run it more conservatively their brake cooling just run it a bit more conservatively and make sure your brakes get to the end without any sort of uh, surprises being sprung on you I did not expect to see a break on fire in that manner though, or from that, from that type of stress, but I, I digress. That was a very interesting way to start the weekend. Next sundry observation, uh, wet practice and qualifying circuit clear rate. I mean, look at how quick the circuit cleared when the cars were just permitted to run on it. Like, yeah, what else is going to clear the circuit? the cars running just let them run can't go wrong with that <laughs> those who don't stay on circuit they probably weren't supposed to stay on circuit anyway now you got to be a little cutthroat about it at some point this is formula one those who can't stay on circuit probably weren't supposed to stay on circuit anyway mind you it was it was very interesting because all the drivers were avoiding um the inside of turn one so that wasn't drying up, there was just a puddle that remained there and it stayed there. And it's very interesting to see that the circuit has actually experienced compression there o over time. I, I, I wonder what would have perhaps happened in a Grand Prix, but maybe well, in a Grand Prix setting, I should say. But to my understanding, cars would have been attempting overtakes through there anyway and going side by side, so the puddle would have been cleared up anyway at some juncture and that was very interesting for qualifying that well there's a puddle on the inside of that well at the apex of turn one so can you really take dry tires through it georgie tried to take dry tires <laughs> georgie tried to take dry tires uh next sundry observation uh the formation lab parking lot unfortunately i haven't been able to go and watch f1 live in the flesh outside of i don't know what, what, what year was that 96 i believe outside of that i've not 
going to see, not being able to go see a Grand Prix live in the flesh. So the formation that parking lots are regularity. Because that's bad optics. <laughs> Just putting it out there. That's bad optics. I, I, I don't know what you could maybe tell the drivers to make that not happen, but it's, it's very... It's very foolish seeing cars quite literally parking on the formation lap waiting for the rest of the field to pull ahead. Especially while the front of the grid is quite literally approaching the end of the circuit and then they all like catch right back up again just for the end and they park right again at the, at the back chicane. That was very silly to see for me but I, I, I digress. And there's one uh, other sundry detail I want to put into I want to drop in this weekend and that is the Concord Agreement and Andretti Motorsports. Now Andretti Motorsports they're trying to buy well they're trying to gain an entrance onto the F1 grid. They're trying to get a slot and the the difficulty with with the Andretti bid over perhaps the Audi and Porsche bid because Porsche they're just offering an engine program and Audi, they're offering a works program, but they're not going to start the teams from scratch, as it were. Andretti are going to start the team from scratch. They're going to be an eleventh team, and that's that that, that 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 that's a problem for well, for all the teams, quite frankly, because they don't want to divide the prize money anymore. They don't they don't want it to be divided between an 11th team. If Andretti uh, perhaps timed their entry better and they scheduled to come in as the current Concord agreement started, that would be that would be one thing. If they were trying to come in as the next Concord agreement comes into play, that would be one thing. If they do, if, if, if they do come in, if they are serious about coming in, that will probably be when they come in. The likes of Audi and Porsche, they do not have to worry about the next Concord agreement because of how they want to enter F1. Just for anyone who wants it, perhaps an update on that. I don't consider it that important. Um, it will only be important once Andretti have a slot confirmed, and uh, I can only really see that happening when, when the current Concord agreement ends, and that will be scheduled for 2025. So, 2026 does Andretti an entrance by then i don't know we'll have to see what happens all right that should be the gp observations for the canadian grand prix uh, i will i will be touching on mercedes and perry's um this week as the week unfolds there's no grand prix this weekend so we've got some extra days to play with um and yeah that, that should be that that's the vid peace Breezy. Let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there. Hey, 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 let's go. Cause I'm feeling like I'm running and I'm feeling like I gotta get away, get away, get away. Better know that I don't and I won't ever stop. Cause you know I gotta win every day, day. Go. See if you really wanna pop me. Go. Just know that you will never pop me. Go. And I know that I gotta be a little cocky. Go. You ain't never gonna stop me. Every time I come a nigga gotta set it, then I gotta go and I gotta get it, then I gotta blow and I gotta shut it. Any little thing a nigga think that he be doing, cause it doesn't matter. Cause I'm gonna dead it, dead it. Then I'm gonna murder everything and anything about it. Boom, about it. Do a lot of things to make it clearer to a couple niggas that I always win and then I gotta get it again and again and again. And I be doing it to death and now I move a little foul. I nigga better call a rap and everybody know my style. I niggas know that I'm the best when it come to doing this and I be banging on my chest and I bang in the east and I bang in the west and I come to give you more and I would never give you less. You will hear it in the street and you can read it in the press. Do you really wanna know what's next? Let's go. See the way we own it and we all up in the race and you know we gotta go not try to keep up with the pace. If we struggling and hustling and the it and I get it and we always gotta do it. Take it to another place. Gotta taste it and I gotta grab it and I gotta cut all through this trap.